Okay. All right. So thank you, everyone. And on behalf of the Ridgewood Library, our director, Nancy Green, and the friends of the Ridgewood Library, I'm delighted to introduce you to mystery writer Sujata Massey. Uh, Sujata's novels have won many awards, but um, I was excited to see that in 2019, the Widows of Malabar won uh, the Mary Higgins Clark Award, and Mary Higgins Clark was a good uh, local resident, so that was, that's very special for us, <laughs> so uh, you're one of our own. <laughs> um, her newest novel, the um, and uh, uh, correct me if I'm saying or pronouncing wrong, the Satchapar Moonstar features a return of Purveen Mystery, Bombay's first female lawyer from her first no uh, novel in the series, The Widows of Malabar Hill. Um, you can also find some of her other novels from her other mystery series, the Ray Shamira novels from Hoopla uh, Digital. There's quite a few of those, so you can download them there. And at the end of the talk, I'll be sharing her uh, website. So you can uh, visit her website. You can also purchase her books on Amazon.com. And if you go to smile.amazon.com, you can support the Friends of the Ridgewood Library. Uh, so thank you again for joining us. Uh, we all miss you at the library. Um, and we can't wait to see you for real in person. Um, but I will leave it to Sujata. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I hope you don't catch a lot of background sound. Um, I am on my porch, and there's a darling five-year-old playing next door. So we may hear some cries and, you know, some silly stuff going on. So hopefully it won't be too disruptive. Um, the first thing I wanted to ask if anybody, raise your hand if you've um, read any of my books. I'm just curious. Okay, so we've got, we got three, okay, three out of six. So good, so I can, I'm gonna do sort of an overview and we see we have somebody else joining us. Um, so I've been writing for about oh, more than 20 years, maybe almost 25 years I've been writing mystery and historical fiction. And um, probably it all began when I was a child and I fell in love with books pretty young, you know, right, I was a, you know, I started reading about the same time as a lot of people in kindergarten, but the difference is I just found books so much better than what my day-to-day -day life was that I just disappeared into books. And um, I read a lot of historical fiction that was written a long time ago. The writer Frances Hodgson Burnett, who did, you know, The Secret Garden and Little Princess was really influential for me. And I'll, I'll probably circle back to her later um, because there's a link between her work, I think, and what I'm doing now. Then I read all the mysteries. I read the Nancy Drew. I read Sherlock Holmes. I read um, Agatha Christie books. Um, there were a whole lot of really fun British mysteries by a writer called Enid Blyton. Um, I was actually born in Britain and my dad is Indian and my mom is German. So that sort of explains, I think, why I had all this British fiction early on and I've had some kind of interesting work to do processing being a British born person, but being a brown British person and um, my family in fact leaving be at a young age because they believed that we would always be second class citizens there. And that's why they came to the United States. And, um, you know, for, for more or less, you know, we've, we've been fine here. And I write, you know, I've said I wrote, I wrote a mystery series first, which was set in modern Japan, featuring a young Japanese American woman called Rei Shimura. And I did that because I lived in Japan at the start of my marriage. And I was so enamored of the world around me that I just wanted to share it because I thought I was seeing a place where people had this reverence for the past, yet a, a, yet a culture that was moving very fast in, you know, beyond the present and beyond things that we were doing in the United States at the time. And it was an interesting contrast. And I felt like I had a 
nice view. I had a real view of how women and children were managing. And I, I, I worked that all into my books. And then I, I did that for quite a while. Um, that series was published by Harper Collins. And then I took a break from that. I actually physically moved. Um, by then, I was still married to the same person, but I had two little kids. And we moved to Minnesota, which is actually where my parents live. And we moved for um, my husband's work. And I was casting about for what I wanted to do next after having written um, 10 novels that were set in Japan. I knew I wasn't going there as much. And I didn't really have an inclination to go except for work. But I was getting more and more drawn into India, um, in large part because it was my heritage. And my parents were around. And I was starting to um, want to share things with my children. You know, one of the things about being an immigrant in the United States, and it's been like this for, you know, going back centuries, is that a lot of times you drop away what you came with um, because you just want to fit in. You just want to be um, not treated as an outsider. And I could see from my children that looked really different um, that I wanted them to be comfortable with, with more than I'd been comfortable with as a child. So I became very involved in an English, uh, an Indian cultural school and that got me studying Hindi. And then I started studying Hindi at the University of Minnesota um, with all these bright whiz kids who could remember things. And at that time I was over 40. And so I see somebody laughing. I had that 40 year old brain and it's, it's hard to learn a language after you're 40. Um, and so I, I was doing that and, and having these wonderful conversations with my father, who was born in um, pre-independent in, pre India. He was born in the 30s when the British were still in power. And his family went back a long way. And there were a lot of interesting things that I didn't learn until those years as you know, a young mother sitting with my father, trying to learn a language and trying to wrap my head around a new book. So I wrote a standalone called The Sleeping Dictionary, which I encourage everybody to get from the library if you haven't read it yet, if you're done with the Purveen series. But what has really worked very well for me is this new series I'm writing. Um, the first book in the series is The Widows of Malabar Hill, and the second one is The Set of Four Moonstone. And um, these are mystery novels that are set in 1920s Bombay. And I decided to write about Bombay. It was, it's actually the city where my stepfather's family comes from. My father is from Calcutta. And I'd written about that in The Sleeping Dictionary. But having done that work in a, the work of researching a book, and I spent four years researching this book, um, in a city that doesn't have a lot of preservation, it has a lot of history, but a lot of stuff was falling apart and it was difficult to get around. And so when I went to Mumbai, as Bombay is now called, and I saw the level of historic preservation and that a lot of these old buildings from the Victorian period and from the early 20th century are still in use. They're now Indian government buildings, they're private clubs, you know, they're hotels, their schools. I knew I could walk through the scenes and really paint a picture for you. And then there was yet another fascinating thing about um, this part of Western India. This was an area where um, families, where there were a lot of educated, affluent families that had a progressive attitude toward um, women and women's work. So this was the part of India where the first women were allowed to work in the professions, really work in the professions. Like in Calcutta, there were women, yes, they were teaching and they were poets and they were writers. Um, but in, um, in Mumbai, in Bombay, this was where the first women lawyers were. And there was a lawyer who, a woman lawyer, the first in the British Empire, um, Cornelia Sarabji, an Indian woman, studied at Oxford, 
and returned to India to work. And her work was really 100% on behalf of women and children, people who had absolutely no voice and who had been disregarded. A real woman who had left memoirs for me to read and to use and to love and to think about um, when I wanted to create my own fictional character. Also in Bombay, India's second woman lawyer um, had lived and worked. Her name is Mikantata Lam, and she was India's first barrister. And she actually pushed through legislation to improve um, the chance of people being able to divorce um, because there were different legal codes for every religious community. And some of them were really prohibitive um, toward women inheriting money, women having um, the right to divorce. And her own community, the Parsis, were um, especially hard hit by um, the divorce laws. So I created a character named Purveen Mystery, and she is the first um, woman lawyer in Bombay. And I mentioned that these, this other one has come before. You know, she sort of is always referred to with admiration in the book. And Purveen works with her father because no other law firm would hire her because she's a woman. And she um, carves out a niche for herself, finding out, uh, finding ways to help women that are at risk of losing their inheritances and a lot more. And, you know, that's what happens in the Widows of Malabar Hill. Um, She's trying to settle the estate. An elderly man has, has passed away. He's left behind three widows. And the reason he left behind three widows is because in the Islamic faith, he was entitled to have three wives under Indian law at that time. And all these wives have children and they, none of them get along and the children all, everybody seems to have a claim on the inheritance, but then all of a sudden the inheritance is whisked away from them. So she wants to make sure that they are um, fairly treated, that they know what their rights are. And of course, when she goes to counsel them, it all goes wrong and it turns to murder. You know, that's what makes it a mystery. And the second one, the Satapur Moonstone, kind of plays into my love of royalty and palaces and things like that. And uh, when I went on one of my research trips to India, I went to stay in a palace in Rajasthan. And um, if anyone's been to India, you probably know that a number of these palace families, there were so many, there were hundreds of palaces in India that were owned by, you know, these families. And they can't, they don't, they can't really support the houses anymore just as residences. Um, so that a lot of them have turn part of their palace property into a hotel. So I stayed at one like that, that also had an extraordinary museum that included, um, you know, the oldest part of the palace and the quarters where the women lived and men couldn't come in. And I, I used that experience to um, create a novel where Praveen is called to go and visit a palace where there's a suspicion that the young Maharaja who is um, going to ascend to the throne is not being educated correctly. And the British felt very strongly that the Maharajas had to be educated a certain way so that they would, number one, not rebel against the British. Um, and, you know, number two, just be, be close to them, you know, be, feel you know, be, be educated in a, in a certain way that they approved. And the British had the right to choose who they married. They had the right to allow them to leave India or not leave India. And all this Praveen finds out, and it's a very complicated assignment because the client who's paying her is the government and she's interested in freedom for India. So she has a lot of mixed feelings about that. And, you know, there's a, a mystery that develops and she wants to protect the people but she doesn't want to get her client in trouble and um you know she wants what's best for everyone so how does she do it 
Uh, so I'm continuing these mysteries. I have one coming out next year, which is sort of about um, a co-educational college. It's based on a real college in Bombay um, that was run by missionaries. And I did some um, research on what the experience for girl students was like. And also some interesting stories about violence against women at that time. And I'm kind of pulling that together in the third book. So that's a little overview of what I'm doing. And I'd love to hear from you directly if you want to ask the question directly on Zoom or if you want to post it in the chat, Carrie can share it. But here, I'm, I'm, ready, to, I'm ready to hear from you. Uh, thank you so much. If you if you uh, have a question, like I said before, you can um, like some of you have your camera on, so you can wave, <laughs> or there's that feature where you can raise your hand. Um, uh, well, well, one of the things that I wanted to point out um, is I actually I don't really read mysteries that often, and when I was reading your books, they were very refreshing because you know when you read a lot of mysteries. You know, I kind of feel like I'm constantly trying to find out, oh, who is it? Who is it? Where I felt like I learned so much from your novels. And, and especially there was so much, um, you know, kind of like tension between the different characters, whether it was someone was from a different cast or someone was British and, or it was a man and a woman. So I, are those, um, like having those juxtapositions make, create, great characters. They were almost all suspicious of each other in ways. Um, I, 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 it's not really a question, but I just, it was really um, something that was very refreshing to me reading your books, how you develop these characters. It's not about that trickiness for me. Like, I'm just not very, very skilled at that doing a very, very tricky plot. And so often when I start a book, I don't know who is the murderer. And that was the case in that book. And that almost makes it a little bit better, I think, because then I don't point to, you know, that there's, there's the, the suspicion is swirling everywhere because my mind is swirling. Yeah, it was almost like every character, I was like, oh, this person, this person. And I, I was like, you know what, I have to stop guessing. I have to just read this. And it was really wonderful. And it was wonderful to learn, especially, um, as you mentioned, to learn more about the the female lawyers at that time. And now they were more solicitors? They didn't really... Well, Bean is a solicitor because at that time, this year 1921, women were not being granted degrees from Oxford. They could study at Oxford. They could take exams. They could take a solicitor's exam but they could not um, actually get an Oxford degree. And you needed that degree to be recognized by the London Bar or by the Bombay Bar. So that's why she's a solicitor right now. Oh, oh. <laughs> um, Susan has a question, I think. Yeah, Susan. Oh, remember to unmute yourself there. Yeah. Yeah, um, thanks. Actually, it's just a comment. Um, I've read nearly all the Ray Shimura books. Um, I've yet to read Katsuna Coast, if I'm saying that correctly. And I look forward to that. And I, uh, so when I ran out of those, then I found your new series. And I was like, oh, I don't know. I love them. So I just, <laughs> I just love it. I can't wait for the next book. Um, what I loved about the Ray Shimura series was how each book highlighted a different aspect of Japanese culture, whether it's Igabana or something, or antiques or something. I just really enjoyed that. Um, and, but now I'm also enjoying the new series that in India and learning a lot about the history, which I did not know. So um, thank you. Well, I appreciate you giving it a try because I was very nervous to start a new series because I, I have a newsletter, so I'm in touch with readers and anybody can sign up for it. Go to sujatamassey.com and I send out a newsletter maybe every six or eight weeks. And I knew that people wanted it and I knew I'd be disappointing people. So it means a lot that you tried the new book. Thank you very much. 
we we did have someone uh, in the chat. Oh, uh, maybe uh, we'll get to Joseph first, and then I'll ask to read a short passage, uh, if possible. Um, but Joseph yep. has a question, so uh, whatever order you'd like to do that. <laughs> Um, let me think what I want to do. Um, yeah, and how, how short a passage can I read? That's the, that's the trick because I don't want to, um, I don't want to run over time, but I definitely do have some, I definitely do have a little bit of stuff I can read. I'm good, so I'll read, I'll read you a few paragraphs from the Satipur Moonstone. Yeah. And this is about when Purveen has arrived at the palace and it's her first night there and it's the rainy season and she's feeling very much alone. And um, this is what she thinks when she's standing on this palace balcony. And that when I stayed at this palace in Rajasthan, there was a similar balcony. And the night I arrived, the rainy season started. So <laughs> it was a wonderful thing to stand on a balcony and watch it rain. Once she was in her nightgown and had her hair braided for the night by Chitra, Praveen slipped out to stand on the room's sheltered balcony. The chatter of tree frogs and crickets and pounding rain filled her ears like London traffic. But unlike in London or Bombay, here the sky was very black. The only light was a low down pinpoint in the distance. Perhaps it was a guard's lantern. This thought made her remember Lakshman and the other men who were sheltering in servants' quarters. They were likely to be asleep after their tiring journey with a palanquin on their shoulders. They wouldn't be worrying about the dark mountains surrounding them or anything else. Praveen had not been afraid at Colin's bungalow the night before. It was a small property in the heart of the forest, yet she'd not been safe because someone had burglarized her room. Since that discovery, she'd been on edge. Perhaps it was because of the Choti Rani's talk of poison and hints of an unscrupulous brother-in-law, or it was because the Dowager Maharani Putlabai had been such an antagonist. In any event, Praveen was more alone than she'd been in a very long time, even in the secure palace complex filled with servants and guards. She wondered if the Dowager Maharani felt that way too. Putlabai had been a widow for 10 years and suddenly suffered the deaths of her son and eldest grandchild. Her loneliness and fear of other losses must have been overpowering. So that's my little excerpt. So a lot of people mentioned in that. <laughs> yes, thank you so much for sharing. That was wonderful. Uh, Joseph, you had a question and then we'll go to Karen. Oh, just gotta unmute yourself, Joseph. When we go back to normal, see that's our new phrase, unmute yourself. Apparently, uh, back in uh, the 1920s, uh, there was a lot of sexism in India. I I'd like to know if present day India is any different for women right now. Well, there, there still is sexism, just like, you know, sort of around the world, I would say. Um, however, that particular city, Mumbai, is one of the places where it's safer. It's safer to be out, but it's not completely perfect. I think one of the things that happened in India in recent years is more and more young women have been um, working at places like call centers. They have more income. A lot of them are in school. Um, they are doing things like going places with students. They might go to a bar to drink with friends. And when certain men see that kind of behavior, they get really angry. They just get really angry. So I think a lot of the violence is a toward women, like some of the horrific things, like what happened in Delhi with the young woman who was um, taken on the bus and, you know, raped and murdered. 
um, it's a reaction of feeling less successful than these women. You know, that, that's my take on, on why there's been a rise in this violence, like that women's independence can be really threatening. Good question. And in the beginning of the Satyapur Moonstone, there was this line that I'm, I'm still remembering and I'm probably gonna botch it up, but how she said she was well known, but wasn't getting the jobs. So it was like, you know, that kind of was just like a perfect way of how she saw herself as a, a female lawyer. I thought just yeah. the way it was written was really wonderful. Okay, Karen Swanson. Okay, um, I had a question about um, Zoroastrianism. Um, I have read every single one of your books, oh. including the newest. Um, I am a major fan. Um, in, I have a very good friend who's a Jain, and so I know a little bit about her religion and Hinduism through her, but I know very little about Zoroastrianism. Um, in the book, Praveen wears a kurta, I believe, a, a thread or a, a, some kind of a rope around her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you did explain it a little bit. I, I still had questions about it. Um, but I also wonder why you made your main character a Parsi and how that uh, the religion and the culture um, factors into who she is as a character. Mm -hmm. That's a really great question. I'm glad you brought it up because I didn't get to it in the introduction. So when I talk about people being progressive and how that back in history, there were certain groups that were progressive, the Zoroastrian people in India, they're a tiny minority that had come from Persia. They started coming in maybe the 700 BC and they kept on coming in immigration waves from Persia to India. Um, they were the most willing, the first group to allow the women, the daughters to work in professional jobs. And the first two women lawyers in India who I told you about earlier, Cornelia and Nikon, they both had Parsi heritage. So even though my heritage in India is Hindu, I didn't feel right saying this lawyer is going to be a Hindu because they were more protective toward women um, than the Zoroastrians were more um, relaxed about it. It wasn't like that they thought the girls were worthless or would never get hurt, but they felt that for women to have these jobs, professional jobs, was, was to confer status on the family, on the whole community, and to do a lot of good. They felt like they were that women needed to do these jobs in order for everybody to be served, you know, for, for schools to be good, um, for the law to be fair, um, for, you know, to, to deliver good medical care. I mean, that was just the feeling. It was the value system. So for that reason, she's a Zoroastrian. And um, I, I had to learn about it through making... Zoroastrian friends, which was wonderful. Um, a really nice time. Um, and the community has been very welcoming. And so typically when I do my research, I go and I sit with a, a friend of Parsi, and they call Parsis. I, I use these words interchangeably, Parsi and Zoroastrian, but Parsi basically means a Zoroastrian who was born in India. Um, so I spend time socially with Zoroastrians. We sit and we talk about these things. Like I usually Zoroastrian women, I ask them, you know, I've asked pretty personal questions about marriage and about um, customs around giving birth. Um, I've talked to their, their mothers. I've talked to elderly women, grandmothers, you know, I've um, journalists, Zoroastrian journalists, um, all kinds of people. It's, I, really, I really have liked it. And it's another important reason to be in Mumbai because that is the largest concentration of Zoroastrians left in the world is there. And unfortunately, it's such a declining community. It's only about 
50,000 people now, 50, I think in all of India that, that are Parsis. And at the time that I was writing, um, I believe it was 100,000. So the time of the 1920s. So that's, that's a pretty steep decline. You, you talked about how, you know, a lot of your, um, you do a lot of research for your novels and, and just with reading, you can see how much research you did. Um, now that with quarantine, you know, and not being able to go to some of these places to write, or, like how, how's it been? For well, I was really lucky that I just decided to go to, to India last January. I mean, this past January. And when I was over there, the news, we were hearing the news about China, but nothing, we weren't hearing news about anywhere else. So I was able to just live a fully normal life, writer's life in India for three weeks and eat where I wanted, shop where I wanted, do my research, not worry about it, hygiene more than the average traveler would, you know, which of course I do. So I got a ton of research done for um, fact checking this book three that I was telling you about, which is about co-education and um, women in colleges. And then a little bit of a start on book four. Like I'm really interested in the history of Jewish India, mm -hmm. that there were Jewish, you know, that there's a whole Jewish community there and that also that the women in this community did some really important things, um, especially in healthcare and teaching. So I was, I made that contact, you know, and I made my police contact and I, you know, so I, I got some very important relationships made. And so now I hope to continue back and forth over Zoom and WhatsApp and things like that. I will go, I, am, I will go back to India again I probably won't go until I've had a vaccination, um, but I, you know, I do plan to go and I have lots of pictures too. And the, the thing about writing about the past is basically it's, a, it's an even playing field for everybody. It's how hard do you want to research when you're trying to write a book that's set in the past? Whereas if I were setting up, setting, writing a book that's set in modern India, I mean, I, I can't do that very well. I can't do that like somebody who lives there, who's, you know, an in, in, in Indian, you know, full, you know, fully invested in Indian life person. So I, I'm glad that I'm working with the past and that I still have access to a lot of documents online and people who, who know what they're talking about. Wonderful. Oh, uh, Joanne Stolfo has a question. Uh, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah. How, how, how um, much have your parents contributed to uh, your background on India? You've talked about, you know, your research and your travel. Um, are there any um, real gems that they've given, given you that uh, you haven't experienced in travel, but have experienced from their history there? Oh, yeah. So um, when I was, I was trying to put together a timeline of what was going on in Calcutta during World War II, and I came across some information that the Japanese had bombed um, in, I think it was 19, I think it was 1943, 42 or 43, that they had bombed Calcutta. And this was a strike against the British. It was not meant as a strike against the Indian people. And my, and my father said, oh, I remember the siren and I remember we ran and we were so scared because the, all the um, military guns of the, were protecting the areas where the British were, but not the areas where ordinary Indians lived. So I was really taken by that story. Um, and so I love I love that kind of thing when I when and it those are the things that maybe we forget but when somebody starts talking about that era it all comes back which is interesting and so with um, Bombay um, this is where my stepfather's family lives and I spend a, a lot of time visiting with them and 
um, you know, that in my books, I talk about this tea that Pervin drinks, that her family makes, her mother makes it with lemongrass and ginger. And that's the tea that my um, cousin makes in, in um, Mumbai. And I've watched her make it. She's taught me many times. Mine is never as good. And, and because that side of the family comes from Gujarat, which is where the Parsis were before they came to, um, to Bombay, the Parsis in my book. So it's a shared culinary history and it's a, it's a shared language. So I benefit from that, even though, you know, I am not by blood Gujarati and I'm not by blood um, Parsi. You'll be invited to our cookbook club next. Oh. <laughs> There are some excellent Parsi cookbooks out there. Um, there's, oh. yeah, I have to give you the information later because it's slipping my mind, but there's a really, really great one that was written by a Parsi woman who now lives in California. Um, that it's like, I just, I love that book. I got it from my library, it's out of print. <laughs> oh, okay. Did you, you have a question? I thought I saw you waving before, or? Oh, you do. Hi, you can talk. <laughs> um, I would just wanted to know a little bit about your uh, your writing process. Do you write every day, and how do you approach uh, something from more or less from start to finish? Uh, I know you said that you don't figure out the mystery beforehand, so you didn't do what Zola did, which we had a cork board in his uh, in his bedroom with with post uh, little the early French equivalent of post-it notes saying this happens, then that happens, then this happens, and then his only problem was to write it. Well, actually, I'm a mixture of things. First of all, I do have to write a synopsis for my publisher for them to get behind the idea of the book. And when I do that, they also sometimes they say, hey, the way you're, you're, you say this thing is unwinding or going to unfold, we don't see enough mystery here. So you, you need to like amp it up a little bit in the beginning, you know, or that was some, so I'll get a little bit of help like that. Mm -hmm. okay. And I do have a cork board. I honestly oh. do. Okay. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily have um, the killer on it, but it has all the scenes that I want to have. And then somehow after I've been writing, maybe even for a few months, I get an idea who I might want it to be. Then I can look at my cork board and I can think about, where are they in this story and where are they appearing? Because I want to be fair to the reader. I never bring somebody out of the, you know, from behind the curtain at the end. Right. You are there all along and you just didn't notice. Um, so that's the way I, I do that. And as far as my, my habits go, I, I have the most energy in the morning. So I really try to do it and I try to do that, that kind of writing in the morning. Um, but then I, I have lately found that um, if I take a really long break, like a gardening break or something, that will put me in the mood to write again in the afternoon for a little bit. So that's really good. Like, like that's, that's my new therapy, my therapeutic break is to go out and, you know, play in the dirt and pull some weeds. And then I don't, you know, I, I just think I have to keep moving around. There are writers who can work eight to 10 hours a day. I met the writer, Anne Perry, who writes these wonderful mysteries set in Britain. And she told me that she writes eight to 10 hours a day. And I am more like two to three hours a day, sometimes one hour a day. Um, today I had to write something else. So I didn't write the book today. I, I wrote another thing but I spent, you know, some hours on that. Thank you so much. Uh, any last questions? All right. Well, I want to thank uh, Sujata. I want to thank everyone here for joining us this evening. You're absolutely wonderful. And you can tell that our library loves your books. So we're, we're just so happy and delighted that you could join us tonight and talk about it and your research process. It was absolutely wonderful. I want to give a shout out to all of you for coming. You know, New Jersey has been through so much 
with this um, epidemic and I know it's, it's not going away and it's a tremendous amount of stress and I really appreciate you coming to be here and I hope that you all stay well and um, the safest thing is to, is to hide in a book. I wouldn't say hide, I would say the safest thing is to choose to take care of yourself and take care of others by, by doing solitary things like gardening and reading and cooking. Um, I know it added a lot to, to my life just to do those things. Yes. Uh, and one more thing, if anyone, I'm just going to share the screen real quick, uh, please, his website. And also be sure to check out her books on Amazon. And if you go to smile.amazon.com, a little bit helps the Friends of the Ridgewood Library that helps with our oh. program. Okay, great. Thank you, Thank everyone. You. Yes, okay. thank you very Bye. much. Thank you very much, and have a great evening. You too. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Let me stop the recording. <laughs> okay.